greetings, traveler from beyond the fog. Cross the fog to the lands between. To stand before the Elden Ring. And become the Elden Lord. There's a special kind of disorientation that occurs when listening to a FromSoft opening storyboard for the first time. Try to recall, if you can, back to when you first played Dark Souls, whether that was in 2011 or just last week, and within seconds of completing the character creation were immediately bombarded with the rapid fire of proper nouns and dense mythology of the opening cutscene. Something about ancient dragons, a Zeus character named Gwyn, fire, and some kind of curse. To us, without knowing the particulars, though it sure was pretty, it was damn near unintelligible. And it even seemed a bit generic, seemingly selected from a grab bag of fantasy tropes. But with each successive playthrough, the opening cinematic began to make a bit more sense, and finally, one day, after the 5th or 6th or maybe 12th time finishing the game, it was clear that the entire world's structure, narrative, and metaphysical philosophy had been revealed within only a short couple of minutes. The Prometheus moment of the first flame. The cosmic dualism at the heart of its Eastern-influenced philosophy the tragic inevitability of the waning fire and the consequences of refusing to move on. It's all there, right from the get-go. But it takes a while for any of that to register, to make any kind of sense. And that's sort of the point. As opposed to the introduction of, say, Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy, which earnestly attempts to explain thousands of years of fictional history in a few minutes to get the viewer up to speed as quickly and efficiently as possible, the introductory cutscenes of FromSoft games are quite aware that you're not going to understand it all the first time around. Successive playthroughs reward the attentive player, and each new viewing brings yet another epiphany. So it is, perhaps even more so, with Elden Ring's opening sequence. Sure, at first it sounded like pure nonsense. Be honest, you chuckled too when the narrator named, while somehow keeping a straight face, THE LOATHSOME DUNG EATER! But then, as with Dark Souls, after the first playthroughs, it began to make at least some sense, even if the full story remained mysterious as ever. It tells the story of the shattering of the Elden Ring, whatever that actually is, the ensuing Shattering War, whatever the actual details of those battles were, and the revival of the Tarnished, even though we don't really know their whole story. As with Dark Souls, on repeat playthroughs, one uncovers the hints of major story elements that were there all along. The dual nature of Merica and Radigan, one shattering and one attempting to mend the Elden Ring, the theft by Moog of Mikola from his cocoon in the Halig Tree, and so on. It really is impressive just how much attention to detail is on display in these scenes. But even now, after innumerable playthroughs and many millions of hours of collective story analysis, not all of its mysteries have been fully revealed. Take, for example, the true nature of the Tarnished, who we are told in this opening cutscene live in a land across the fog. What is this fog? Where are we actually from? Based on the character selection options, we Tarnished may have quite disparate backgrounds. Some of us are descendants of astrologers, some of the Newman, some are samurai for God's sake. And yet, we may all hear the call of long lost grace and be summoned back to the Lands Between. Speaking of which, just how did we make it back to the Lands Between in the first place? And just kind of magically appear at the Chapel of Anticipation? 
Even more mysteriously, just as the narrator beckons us to rise from the dead and heed the call of long lost grace, we are shown a scene from a location which does not even exist in game. A scene from a cold crypt, with countless dead tarnished being blessed by a priest performing some kind of sacred ritual. All while the voiceover narration tells us to Rise now, ye tarnished, ye dead, who yet live. The call of long lost grace speaks to us all. The implication is clear, even if the full story remains opaque. In this scene, dead tarnished are being resurrected and impressed into America's service by the call of Long Lost Grace. But where this scene takes place and what its full context is remains strangely elusive. Why were we sent outside the Lands Between in the first place? Why and how are we being called back now? In this episode we will attempt to unveil the mystery of this scene, and what it reveals about the guidance of Grace, the land beyond the fog, and us, the Tarnished. One cannot understand the Tarnished without first understanding Grace, that which we as Tarnished were deprived of. Luckily, trusty old Vare is here to help. Are you familiar with Grace, the golden light that gives life to you, Tarnished? You may also behold its golden rays pointing in a particular direction at times. That is the guidance of grace, the path that a tarnished must travel. And Melina tells us much the same. This tiny golden aura is the grace of the Erd Tree. This light once shone in the eyes of your tarnished brethren, but now it is all that guides you. Also, I hear you can see them, can't you? The rays of grace that guide you through your burden. So the guidance of grace is what guides us tarnished through our journey. It gives us our purpose, and it manifests in our eyes, quite literally changing how we see the world. Beyond that, it animates us. It gives us the power of resurrection, something Miyazaki himself addressed before the game's release. He said, quote, the immortality of the Tarnished originates with the guidance of grace. Tarnished are those who have died outside the lands between, only to be awakened by grace and beckoned there. That's where your story begins in Elden Ring. That guidance won't let the character go." End quote. So it is simultaneously that which animates, guides, and also binds us. But we also learn quite early on that not all Tarnished can see Grace. By the way, do you still see it? The guidance of Grace. You do. Wonderful news. Most Tarnished are blind to it these days. You are something of a rare breed. And we learn through her hood that Roderica never saw the guidance of grace at all. Some are blessed by grace, others are not. And it is a personal, individualized bestowal. As with the tragedy of Ludwig's holy moonlight, the guidance of grace is a private, elusive sort. At this point, the religious connotation should be clear. Grace is bestowed through the power of the Erd Tree. Those with it view themselves as guided by their God's will, and those without it are judged harshly by this religious orthodoxy. To take just one of innumerable examples, the Albanurics are said to, quote, live impure lives, untouched by the Erd Tree's grace, end quote. In other words, they are impure because they are without grace, and they are persecuted for it. Those with grace, conversely, are the chosen ones. 
Likewise, the purpose or objective of grace is not particularly mysterious. It wants, if we can directly ascribe it agency, us to brandish the Elden Ring and become Elden Lord. Once again, the opening cutscene lays it all out pretty clearly. To stand before the Elden Ring. and become the Elden Lord. But where things start to get really interesting is when we reflect on the apparent arbitrariness of its favor. Nowhere better exemplified than by the Ark of Godfrey and his kinsfolk, the Tarnished. We know from Horalu's remembrance that Godfrey was robbed of his grace, leading him down the path of exile to a land outside the lands between. In essence, the diaspora that sets up the Zionism at the heart of the Tarnished's central purpose. And for once, we actually get to hear from one of the key players in this story herself, when Melina channels Marika. My lord, and thy warriors, I divest each of thee of thy grace. With thine eyes dimmed, ye will be driven from the lands between. Ye will wage war in a land afar, where ye will live and die. Then, after thy death, I will give back what I once claimed, return to the lands between, wage war, and brandish the Elden Ring. Grow strong in the face of death. Warriors of my lord, Lord Godfrey. Again, the superficial elements are clear enough. Merica robbed the tarnished, us, of our grace, and exiled us to beyond the fog, whatever that means. While it's true that the rusted anchor strongly suggests that the tarnished left by boat, likely from the Weeping Peninsula, Clearly, that's not how we return to the Lands Between. After all, we arrive, more or less magically, after being bestowed grace at the Chapel of Anticipation. A towering and isolated sea stack rising hundreds of meters above the water. Something that would be completely infeasible to reach by ship. Not to mention the door of the chapel is closed when we arrive, further suggesting that we magically materialize there likely in much the same way that we fast travel to Sites of Grace. Suffice it to say, we do not sail back to the Lands Between. Precisely why Godfrey and his kin were robbed of Grace is, of course, never specified. But, for now, the point we would like to highlight is the pure arbitrariness of it all. Merica just gets to decide, seemingly on a whim, that she will rob us of our Grace and then basically give it back whenever she feels like it. The utter powerlessness and lack of agency of Godfrey and his clan is striking. Much figurative ink has been spilt trying to figure out just what Merica's master plan really is, and the difficulty in doing so only reinforces that her actions are, in the end, inscrutable. It is indeed frustrating to not know the intentions of the central agent of this world, and we, as the puppet tarnished, can only look around for evidence of our strings. But to those who are versed in Christian theology, from which the game draws heavy inspiration, this should all be quite familiar. God's plan is ineffable, and if you think you understand Merica's plan, you should at least consider the possibility that your understanding relies not on gnosis, but on faith. The concept of grace is fundamental to both classical and modern Christian theology, though, as with everything else in religion, different factions will differ quite vigorously in their interpretations, there is broad agreement that grace is the spontaneous and, importantly, unmerited gift of divine favor and influence from God to his subjects. The unmerited component is key here. It is freely given or taken away by God. It is not earned by the recipient. The Gospels, written originally in Greek, use the term hadis, which simply means that which is given, again emphasizing the point. 
Grace is a gift from God. The grace of Elden Ring's God operates in much the same way. As Merica giveth, she may also taketh away. Grace is not earned in any meaningful sense by the tarnished, nor was it lost in the first place due to a lack of merit. Indeed, quite the opposite. Godfrey is said to have lost his grace right at the peak of his powers, after he had conquered the lands between for Merica and had no more enemies left to vanquish. The dialogue between Merica and Godfrey here highlights precisely the apparent capriciousness of her giving and then taking away grace. No doubt Merica does indeed have a plan, but like any Christian will tell you about God's plan, it is forever obscure and unknowable to us. But that is not the only inspiration taken from Christian doctrine on grace. Among the sources of theological disagreement between various denominations of Western Christianity is the question of the so-called means of grace. That is to say, how is it that grace is actually bestowed? On the one extreme, the Calvinists believe that grace is irresistible, that it is simply given by God, and the recipient plays no role in accepting it whatsoever. But Catholic doctrine holds something quite different, specifically emphasizing the role of the sacraments, in other words, holy rituals, in bestowing grace. Of course, politically this means the church and its priests wield far more power, so the institution has every incentive to emphasize the power of the sacraments. But let's leave aside that cynical realpolitik for now. The key for this discussion is that grace can be given through holy ritual, which brings us, finally, to the mysterious scene in the opening cinematic, in which the tarnished are bestowed with grace. Here we are shown a scene with row upon row of dead, presumably tarnished, being ritually blessed with holy incense, over which the narrator beseeches us to arise ye tarnished, ye dead who yet live. Simply put, this appears to be a kind of resurrection scene, and consistent with that interpretation, what follows in the opening cinematic is the enumeration of individual tarnished being called back to the lands between. Oralu, Goldmask, Fia, and so on. Presiding over the ceremony, at least in icon form, is Merica. But have you ever noticed that the statue of Merica here is inverted? Her arms are held below her shoulders, as opposed to the pose from her numerous statues, her other opening cutscene shot, or indeed the crucifixion pose seen within the Erd tree. In each of these, her body hangs and her arms are suspended above her, like in the Runark crucifixion scene, or indeed its real-world cognate. Here the swirls of her dress are altered too, typically the larger swirl is at the level of her chest, but not so in this scene. The only similar pose to this is the one in the small stakes of Merica, which, interestingly, serve as resurrection points for the tarnished after death as they call us back from the land of the dead, so to speak. And that may be exactly what's going on in this scene. Dead tarnished, so numerous that they can no longer even be fit into the coffins, are undergoing some kind of resurrection ritual. Here, we become dead who yet live. The whole scene has the characteristic hue of the Eternal Cities, and in the back we can just barely make out the characteristic Eternal City symbol, seen also on their giant crypt chairs. Make of that what you will. In the center of the frame we can see the priest with a thurible, the Christian implement of holy incense, hovering over a seemingly fresh corpse, which, unlike the others, is not yet covered in a burial shroud. Perhaps inspired by the notion of real-world Catholic priests, who bestow grace with their holy rituals known as sacraments, this scene shows grace being bestowed on the dead tarnished. Like Merica's dialogue says, we specifically have to die in the lands beyond the fog in order to come back to the lands between. Ye will be driven from the lands between. Ye will wage war in a land afar. 
where you will live and die. Then, after thy death, I will give back what I once claimed. One possible explanation for this moral requirement is that the bestowal of grace can only occur after death by the holy sacrament of resurrection. This would certainly not be the first time that Elden Ring has borrowed from and adapted Christian ritual, and even more specifically, the sacraments. If you've ever wondered what all those big covered bowls are in Lane Dell, well, they're quite specifically baptismal fonts, and the outer structure that contains them is known as a baptistry. Here in Lane Dell, they are nearly identical to the real-world structures where the sacrament of baptism is performed. Although, instead of anointing with holy water, it is the blessed sap of the Erd tree. So important was this sacrament that Mikola even deliberately tried to replicate it with his new Erd tree, the Halig tree. Furthermore, marriage is a sacrament, and we know Elden Ring's story puts heavy thematic weight on the symbolic power of marriage. We become Elden Lord by restoring Merica so that we may marry her, or by marrying Ronnie, in the latter case literally sliding a ring of betrothal on her. And of course Moog intends to start a new dynasty by marrying Mikola. So clearly this game has taken quite specific inspiration from the Christian sacraments, not just borrowing their aesthetics but cleverly adapting their rituals to tell an in-game story. And here, in this mysterious crypt scene, there appears to be occurring, effectively, the Sacrament of Resurrection, of bestowal of grace through sacred rite and blessed incense. Speaking of incense though, like Merica's statue, the incense too is peculiar. It's flowing down, which is just, well, it's not right. And it's not just the thurible held by the priest, either. Even those hanging from the ceiling exhibit this peculiar feature. Everything's a little bit off in this scene. America's pose is inverted. The smoke from the incense flows down. We've seen this oddness before, and quite recently in fact. In the DLC trailer there is, effectively, a bizarro world Church of Cuckoo from the Shadow Realm, in which all of the elements are there, the pews, the same stepped altar, the bird cages, and even a carrion on a throne, and yet everything's a bit off. Likewise in the crypt scene of the opening cinematic, the same features are there, but they're somehow warped. One explanation is that this scene, like the bizarro Church of Cuckoo, actually takes place in the Shadow Realm, with rows upon rows of dead tarnished being called back to the lands between which would mean that the Land of Shadow is among the Lands of Exile of the Tarnished. That, perhaps rather than sending the Tarnished to go die in some faraway land across a physical sea, Merica sent them, or at least some of them, to die in the Shadow Realm. This would certainly be consistent with what little we know of the Shadow Realm so far, that it is a place where those outside the Golden Order would be hidden and that it was a place that became physically disconnected from the lands between. Based on Merica's veil hanging from the shadow tree, veiling the sky itself, and her characteristic cloak hanging on several buildings within the Shadow Realm, it seems likely that Merica herself played a role in its disconnection. So if Merica has the ability to veil the Shadow Realm, and she also has the ability to bestow and revoke grace, then perhaps these two stories, the story of the Tarnishing and the story of the Shadow Realm, are intertwined. Rather than hopping on a boat to get back to the Lands Between, which, again, we clearly don't do, we are summoned by Merica, whenever she pleases, through the bestowal of grace and the lifting of the veil. Now, before you start typing in all caps, we're not suggesting it's anything as simple as the Badlands equaled the Land of Shadow, but there are some intriguing connections here, and regardless of whether you accept this specific interpretation, we're betting that we'll be learning quite a bit more about the Tarnished in the DLC. 
And now to return to the question that started this analysis. What is grace? On the one hand, the symbolic answer is clear. It is the spontaneous and unmerited gift of light from America that allows us to resurrect and fulfill our mission. And while it is manifestly the power of the Erd Tree conveyed through America, the Elden Ring's vessel, it also requires this ritual ceremony of bestowal. But beyond that, towards the central mystery of how grace and its revocation from the tarnished relates to America's plan, its bestowal on a near industrial scale here tells us a few very important things. For one, it tells us that yes, indeed, America likely planned all along for the Tarnish to resurrect and return to the Lands Between. How else to explain the quite complicated ceremony taking place here? This is not something that emerges spontaneously. And once again, it is clear that the ceremony itself is of significance to the main plot of the game because there is no wasted space in this opening cinematic. Every frame tells a story. Furthermore, the fact that the sacrament is occurring without Merica herself present, in other words, that she has appointed a dedicated clergy to carry out this bestowal in her absence, tells us that she likely anticipated her own absence, that she knew she would have lost control over the power to bestow grace and took measures to ensure that her army of tarnished would still be created. Likely this reflects her knowledge of the personal consequences of the shattering of the Elden Ring, that she would end up imprisoned and near powerless in the Erd Tree. This army of undead, so to speak, being created in secret in an unknown location is just one of her many contingencies, and it strongly implies that she foresaw the punishment that would befall her after the shattering of the ring. And finally, the presence of the Eternal City symbol here does seem to indicate that she hatched this plan quite early on in her reign, perhaps even before the nameless Eternal City of Landell was banished underground. As her moniker The Eternal suggests, Merica has plenty of independent ties to the Newman and to the Eternal Cities, and so the creation, in secret, of an effectively immortal army of Tarnished would be the ultimate trump card in the ages-long struggle between these cultures. If one flashpoint was the Knight of the Black Knives, perpetrated by Newman assassins, then what does it tell us about Merica's role that her response to that catastrophe was to begin preparations for the wars to come by creating the Tarnished Resurrection Sacrament? So, finally, imagine you are a tarnished living outside the Lands Between, awaiting the call of long-lost grace, a call that, for all you know, may never come. Your life is a bloody and Sisyphean struggle, but one day, upon a particularly auspicious death, your body is taken for preparation for the Holy Sacrament, to be bathed in holy frankincense and blessed with grace, such that you may return to the lands between. What you would experience moments after death would be the light of grace miraculously becoming visible. Indeed, that is what we can see in the opening cutscene happening to several tarnished characters. Having been blessed with grace, you would awake amidst a sea of fog, now able to traverse this liminal space and re-enter the lands between. Of course, your experience would not be of a priest performing the sacrament, you're already dead. Instead, what you would experience would be the light of grace caressing your open palm. That you would awake in a chapel with a holy maiden awaiting your arrival is certainly no coincidence. Which of course would mean that the sea of fog that all tarnished cross is not so much a physical barrier able to be traversed by ship but a metaphysical one, in essence how one returns from the underworld, the world of things without grace. Indeed, it may even be referred to as a fog because of the hazy smoke of ritual incense that one faintly perceives as the last thing before they wake up in the lands between. 
Sure enough, if you look carefully and follow the trail of incense from the body being currently attended to on down the line to those just previously blessed, you can see that each body is becoming progressively less corporeal, less physical, as it transmigrates from one realm to the next. As the ritual takes effect, the tarnished heed the call of long-lost grace to fulfill their mission to return to the lands between, wage war, and brandish the Elden Ring.